Hello, my friend, and welcome to Security and Security, hosted by me, Johnny Seifert. This is the Celebrity Mental Health Podcast, where I say it's okay to not be okay. And if you have the same match to me, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on ACAST, Spotify, Apple iTunes, wherever you're listening, click that subscribe button, leave a five-star rating and a review, and let's keep spreading the word, it's okay to not be okay. Now, let me tell you about my guest today. I guess that you will know uh, as spending over a decade playing the second Martin Fowler from the age of 11 on EastEnders, where he went through a teen pregnancy, a stalker, a murder, and prison. Since leaving the square, he's taken the theatre world by storm and set up his own company, Actors East, where you can see him in Casserole at the Arcola Theatre in London. So to tell me his mental health journey, I'm delighted to welcome to Skinisco. It's James Alexandro. Hello, mate. Hello, Johnny. How are you doing? Well, this is really weird. I don't know how to bring this up, but I watch classic EastEnders every day. And so oh, yeah. although I'm watching normal EastEnders right now, I'm still in 2004. So really what's just happened is that uh, Sarah has been shipped away and that was your stalker. And this is 20 years ago. Oh, wow. and yet, to me, this is like, oh my God, it's Martin Fowler, who I just watched yesterday, coming back to the square because Sarah's gone and now he's back and is and is recovered and whatnot. Yeah, blimey. I mean, I, I mean, I'm a, I was a baby back then. I was about 18 years old, mate. Um, yeah. Well, well. I'm, I'm sorry you're watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you're putting yourself through that. <laughs> Funny, but I remember that quite well. Does anyone say to you, oh, "I'm watching Classic EastEnders. This has happened. Oh my God, I can't believe you've just killed Jamie." And you're like, "That was 20 years ago." <laughs> I'll be honest with you, like the EastEnder stuff has kind of faded away in the last couple of years, which has been really actually quite nice. Um, so people don't really say much anymore. I, I get the occasional message on Instagram or something from someone in America who's watching it or something, which is quite funny because they seem to be all the way back there on whatever they're watching it on, you know. How does that make you feel, though? Because obviously, when you do a show like EastEnders or if you were on a reality show like Love Island, that label sticks to you forever. And, you know, and when someone dies, it'd be EastEnders legend just passed away and it's like they're in one episode. But for you, you know, <laughs> being in it for 10 years and it really defining that teenage years of where you were trying to find out who James really was, and yet you've got this definition of Martin. How do you find going into your... Because you're about to go into your 40s now, looking back at that child version of you, and yet there's this version of you that the media known as the EastEnders star still? I think probably for a while there in my 20s, I, I, I kind of had a bit of resistance or struggle with that idea. But now it's, it's really, it's really nice. I kind of come to the place of like, oh, when people do talk to me about the show or Martin or whatever, I'm actually quite proud of it. Where I think when you're younger, you kind of just want to get away from the things that you did when you was a kid or, you know, I was 11 years old when I was, started that show. And like you say, you know, it took up my whole growing up bit of my life, you know, and getting, becoming an adult is what I mean. You know, I, I feel like I, tw- you know, I left at 21 and yeah, there was this thing that, that floated around me, which is kind of, I don't know. It's, it's a strange thing. Like you get being known for something is different from being famous from some, for being for something. And now I guess being famous has kind of gone away a bit, which is really nice. That's a nice thing. I'm still known for stuff and I can really enjoy that now. Um, whereas being being famous for something is something that um, really feels quite unnatural, and for me anyway, it didn't I didn't like it. But what did the fame mean to you though? You know, it was pre-social media. You know, you didn't even have MSN at that point. So you know, you were going through this industry very much based on you going to do your job, and then there were newspapers who would be writing articles about the Stender stars and whatnot. And you know. Uh, how did you deal with that fame growing up where you were navigating that world? It wasn't just uh, newspapers writing about you. It was newspapers doing all sorts of naughty things as well, you know, yeah. following you around. And, and it was not nice. You know, it was hard. It was difficult. It was difficult for my family at times, diff- difficult for me. I look back now. At the time, I dealt with it well. You know, you feel like you're dealing with it well and you're, you know, you're getting on with your life. And, you know, it's not, it's not as if I spent much time breaking down over it you know it was just like yeah this was tough and I get on with it now I look back I go that really created a bit of arrested development it it created some issues I guess with me forming relationships with people friendships trust that kind of stuff I can do that in retrospect only now in the last few years when you have a trauma like that through decades and obviously you as you said being known but not being famous and then setting up your own agency and having your own business for the past couple of years (laughs) Do you ever have those traumas of what it was like in that time, thinking, is that going to still carry me forward now? I don't particularly have any traumas or triggers around it anymore. Um, I uh, I guess I do have trauma over it, but I guess, the, um, you know, what does that mean? Um, uh, you get to a certain point where you accept things and you're able to kind of let, it doesn't, it doesn't inform your behaviour anymore. Um, and you can kind of see that when it comes up, those triggers or whatever. 
um, and it not be the thing that that tells you what to do, that you can be, you can, uh, I guess, consciously act in response to these things. What it does do is make me quite protective over young actors or older actors who are suddenly, who I know who might have suddenly got some notoriety, some fame or got on a big TV show. It makes me kind of want to give advice and be very protective over them and make sure that not, my wife's an actor and, and her career is starting to pick up a bit. And so I'm every now and then going well you don't have to do those things they're asking you to do you don't have to do that you can or if you do do them you can ask for certain things you know whereas in my day back in the day it was the the, the, the pressure of having to do everything every press thing every publicity thing being put in positions without being prepped that people are going to investigate your personal life now this with me and you i knew i know what we're I know what we're coming on to do. So I'm, I feel relaxed and, you know, I listen to some of the podcasts and you do a really great job and I feel relaxed and that's cool. But you know, there's certain times when I was younger that I was put in positions where I'm suddenly being asked about drug use, about my sex life, about, you know, what I get up to. And I'm 18 or 19 years old, you know, it's like I'm a baby. Now I look back, it was actually incredibly, incredibly wrong position for a young man to be put into. It doesn't play on my mind now at all, actually. I'm very kind of, I've, I've grown up, if you like, and now I guess I can call myself an adult, you know. But when I was younger, you know, if you'd have spoken to me 10, 12 years ago, I think I would have been sitting here a lot more kind of internally curled up and probably physically curled up as well. There was this thing inside that needed to be protected from all of you that are trying to get in there. And that's gone now, which is a really uh, nice place to be. But I guess I feel, I feel the impulse to protect people that are about to walk into that kind of world. Well, when you yeah. look at your wife and what she's going through in the acting world and how she started training, it's obviously going to be very different from when you were growing up. You know, you had the Anne Scher School where you went to, you had Sylvia Young, and most people came through those schools, but it was very much of you need to be able to sing, you need to be able to dance, you need to be able to act, and then get your auditions. Did they teach you that other side, what the press are like, what... Um, life is like to have that fame and with your wife now is she getting those lessons because obviously we've got social media and we've got way more conversations about mental health and welfare for every single person all the way through that process I wasn't a singing dancing drama school kid that's Anna Shea is actually very different from that it's much more and I'm saying this because it's they did it really well it's much more just like a load of kids mixing from working class to middle class to I guess upper class kids in a room messing about with improvisation and acting. And that was that was a really healthy way to do that. Actually, the, the drama school thing for, for young kids, I'm quite apprehensive about. Um, but no, they didn't. I mean, the short answer is I didn't get any media training. I think that started, to, even on EastEnders, I didn't. And this is, um, this is no criticism of them. It's just that was the culture at the time because they did change it while I was there. But when I came in at 11 years old, there's no media training whatsoever. To kind of, you, you'll maybe, there'll be a, and I guess I didn't start to do any you know, I was 11 years old. So I, I guess I didn't start to have any interaction with like, you know, media journalists. I was maybe a little older anyway. And at that point it was kind of like, all right, you're going to talk, there'll be the Daily Mail there. Just watch, you don't give away the storylines. Yeah, that was about <laughs> They that. care about themselves, uh, not you. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, they did care about us. It just wasn't in the culture. You know, yeah. now we, it seems to be systemic now. You know, everywhere you go, there is, you know, it might be intimacy coordinators if you're, you know, um, if you're working as a director or an actor, um, or there's media training. or It's just in the system now that, that, that the system seems to know we need to take care of people. And that's good that's in the system. I just wasn't in the system there, you know. And the same people that were looking after me then, a lot of them are still at EastEnders and it's in their culture now and they do look after their actors a lot better than they used to. When you think of that time and then you decide, I'm going to leave the show and you and Sonia, your on-screen wife, leave the show in 2007. Um, I was about 14 years old at the time. And <laughs> you go, and so it's a very long time ago for me, let alone for you. That's crazy, yeah. Um, and you go, right, I'm going to leave a show like EastEnders. I want to go acting elsewhere. I want to go into the theatre. I want to just work out who is James the actor that got into the industry, first of all. How did you find that change of not having that definition of EastEnders, not having that weekly show that you turned up at the Bournemouth set every single day that you'd known for the rest of your whole life thus far, and actually going to be yourself and that sense of belonging to not just society, but the media world and especially the acting world where you're now trying to be taken seriously because we know there's always been a snobbery of soap stars. And, you know, over the years, luckily, it started to lessen down. But still, at that point in the mid noughties, if you were on a soap, you might have gone into say Big Brother afterwards, but to be taken seriously in the acting world, in the theatre, would be like, whoa, what are you doing? 
Yeah, that's interesting. That's a, it's a really, I guess, uh, astute question. Um, I would adjust it a little bit because I guess my, my motivation wasn't to be taken seriously, I guess uh, that's, that would be, and I, I understand that it sounds logical that that would be the thing I didn't, I actively didn't do the celebrity big brothers or the, in the jungle or the dance. I've got asked to do all of those things. I got asked to write a book at one point about what it was like. And I just said no to any of that because I, my thing was, wasn't about being taken seriously. It was about, don't be famous. <laughs> that was just get away from being famous. So doing all of those shows just would have like kept that up. And also I would have been really bad on those shows. I just would have been a miserable little git because it just wasn't my, it wasn't my thing, you know? So my motivation was like, don't, don't be famous, learn acting. You know, that was try and learn acting. I had this, and so, and what, it, what Enders did for me was have the opportunity to be gainfully employed as an actor. You know, it was also gave me a lot of great stuff, great opportunity. I, not pick and choose by any means, but there were jobs coming in for theatre where, you know, maybe having an East, a famous name at the time uh, would have, they, they needed that to sell some, put some bums on the seats. I don't command that kind of thing anymore, but back then it was a thing. So it's like, great, I could, I'm not going to do the telly. I'm just going to go do loads of theatre just try and surround myself with actors that have done that for years, try and learn from them. Eventually I realized, oh, actually I do need some actual training because that's something I never had as an actor. I mean, I went to Anna Scher, but that's really, you know, it's a kid's school until you're 14, 15. So I needed, I went back, you know, I started to, I discovered a community of, of actors and, and theater and training, which is, you know, I still do that today. I still really believe in going to class as an actor. So that was really my motivation. And um, so, and, and the, the snobbery, yeah, of course there's a snobbery around it, I guess. I guess I've, I learned very quickly to not care about the snobs, to not want to work with snobs. So it was fine. That was easy. It was like, oh yeah. So if you don't want to employ me because I'm I'm from the telly, then I don't want to work with you either. You know, that's fine. I don't. Why would you want to? Do you know what I mean? Why would you want to go and work with people that are going to look down on you? So, and then and to be honest, it was that was never. I, I guess I never came in contact with that too much. A few instances, I guess, but so that was fine. What was it like to leave? I guess there's a real like. Actually, there's a practical thing, which actually was much more of an effect. I, and I had a schedule every week at EastEnders. You know, you get your call sheets and you've got loads of work to work on. And at 21, having that's all I've ever known, and, you know, my younger years juggling school as well, so being very, 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 very busy all the time, and then suddenly, like, boom, that stops, and there's no one telling you where to be at what time. And that was a bit of a shock, you know, and it sounds really obvious that I should have known that, but you're 21, what do you know? You just suddenly go, oh... I've got loads of time to fill. And I don't know how to fill it. And actually, that was pretty difficult. That was probably the most difficult thing about leaving. And so bringing it up to speed a little bit more, one more question about East End is obviously in 2014, James Bly took over as the third Martin Fowler. <laughs> how did that make you feel at that point? You'd left the show seven years prior. You'd moved on. You'd started getting jobs in the theatre. Then they decide, right, we're going to bring back Martin Fowler. Number one, do I go back? But number two that was me that was my identity and I know it was a character but I lived and breathed that through all those years and mentally what did that do to you when that job came up again and then when Martin uh, and then when James By took it over I guess yeah I'll talk you through it I guess I'll talk you through that process because it was a bit of a process yeah for about a year I guess I, I was I was doing my thing and for me it was like yeah I guess in the back of my mind there was always this like oh it, it, I could go back if they asked and maybe if I campaigned for it, even if I started calling them up and saying, oh, could I come back? That might have been a thing. I never did any of that. And then suddenly, so that little option was open back in my head. And then suddenly, they, yeah, there was a, a phone call or two, I think maybe like three or four times over a year. If anyone listens to this and that's wrong, forgive me. But it was felt like maybe a couple of times over a year or three or four times over a year, they kind of made an approach saying, we're thinking about bringing the character back. We'd love you to come back. We figured about bringing the character back, we'd like to come back, this kind of thing. And each time I was like, no, no. And then on the third time, I did have a little temptation going, mm, maybe I'll, if it was a short stint, if it was three or four months or a year, maybe it'd be fun just to go back and, and see, you know, go start about going back to your old school or something. There's a novelty to it, maybe. And then the call came in and it got quite serious. And um, they said to me, um, if you don't take this, we're still going to bring the character back. And we'd really like your blessing which was a really nice thing for them to say, actually. Like we, it was something like, we really want your permission or your blessing to go and recast it, you know. Obviously, they're going to do it anyway without my blessing, but it's not, nice they asked. And you know what? Just in that moment, I said, um, it, it actually felt really good in my belly to go, let's close that door in the mind. Let's just close that off and say, yeah, go for it. I'd love to see who you cast or whatever. And, and that was the end of my interaction with that. And 
um, I found out old Jimmy Bai, James Bai got the job. And so I, he, he was under contract not to, you know, NDA, not to tell anyone that he'd been cast as, as Martin Fowler. And then I got his number off Natalie Cassidy, I think. So he, he didn't know that I had his number. And I just text him out of the blue. I started to wound him up for a week saying, I know you're going to the square. He didn't know who it was. I think he'd, he got, got a bit worried that he was going to get in trouble. But I said, all right, listen, it's James Alexander. I'm really happy for you. And I'm, um, you know, go do whatever you want with him. Have fun. And I think he's done a great job. I actually met him for the first time about a month ago, two months ago. And it was a really nice moment. What was it like meeting him? And did he ask you anything about Martin? Because obviously he's playing this adult version. And you know, whether he watched the show early on or not, but you knew how Wendy Richards had seen the young Martin that was brought up. So did he ask you for any tips of how to play Martin, even though it was so many <laughs> years later? And secondly, would you go back to the show now? So if he left, would you come back as Martin? Because we've just seen Peter Bill do that. <laughs> well, no, you laugh, you laugh. This just happened with Peter Bill. Thomas Law's just come back in. I'm it. sure. Oh, yeah. and, you know, it's gone around <laughs> again and he played it, then someone else played it and then his back. And if not, would you come back as another character now? Uh, I kind of did go back recently. I, I, I shadowed as a director. So I went, I got, so what that means is you go and follow the director and see how they, they direct the show. And it just so happened that James Bay was on, on the day that I was shadowing. So um, I didn't know that he knew I was there. I think I apparently caught, caught wind of it. And he came on to do a scene and he kind of went, oh, it's you. You know, I was like, oh, it's you. And we just kind of had this. It was a strange, moment, a really strange moment because we don't know each other at all, and the only thing that bonds us are these words on a page called Martin Fowler, you know. And, and um, it was a re- that was a really nice moment. Well, would you go back as a director then? Because a lot of the yeah, Hollywood think stars I... are now coming back in from Hollyoaks years later as writers and directors. Angela Griffin's just directed Waterloo Road, so right. with that mindset of what you're doing right now, yeah, pro- I'm set. Would you direct? Them? Listen, I, I probably would, and um, I probably would because. It's an incredible training for a director. And I'm not to bore you with that, but it's like the, the how they do that show is incredible and all the soaps. Like it's the most intense arena for a director to be in. And um, you're dealing with tons of actors, tons of different actors. And you shoot about, I mean, just if you, you might not know this, but you know, some of our enders, you might shoot something 25 or 30 pages a day. On a film, you might be shooting two, you know. So it's like the intensity is like that much more. It would be an amazing training as a director to do. And I like a, a kind of nostalgia thing going back. And I think I'd have a lot of fun doing it. You know, I just have to demand that I would have to direct Natalie Cassidy because that would be the most fun thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I probably would do that. But coming back as Martin, uh, I don't know. I don't know. That, that door's closed in my head. Maybe if the door was open, if, if Jim, James Bay said, listen, I'm gone and I don't want to do it again, then I'd go, yeah, maybe like a special one-off Christmas thing. That might be funny to do that. But yeah. So why did you go in shadow and then what happened after that? Then why did you not go back to direct? What's the process there? I don't, this is very, very recently. So I guess I might still go back to, uh, to direct. I don't know. I, I, I just, it's not up to me, I guess. Um, well, look, the process is I'm a direct, you know, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a director, I make theatre and that's, I do act, but I guess that's a lot of my attention is on that. And I'd like to direct television and one of the natural progressions as a tv director is to do a soap you might love it and stay there or you might go and see if there's something else beyond that i guess my cv isn't very big as a director so it would the idea would be to go pick up some shadowing work which would go on the cv and then eventually some they might say hey look you, you feel we feel like you're ready to direct something i don't know that's not it's not in my hands and it's not really a discussion we've had but it's been, it was really nice to go back and see some old faces see some of the producers and the, and the guys that work in the office and watch this space on that one i guess Oh, exciting. There's your news line to watch this space. Um, let's talk casserole. Let's talk all things casserole, mate. Tell me what the show is all about. So casserole ostensibly is one big rollicking argument between a couple, right? Between a couple. So Kate and Dom. It's, a, it's, a, it's, like an, it's a one-act place. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. And it all centres on Dom's at home having a good time when he's um, on his own, drinking and smoking some weed and the place is a mess. And he doesn't expect his girlfriend to be back until a couple of days. And she turns up unexpectedly. She's had a panic attack. She's been at an award ceremony. She's a music video producer. She catches him kind of in this whole mess at home and demands that he tidies up and comes back with her. What she doesn't realise is that he's been defrosting and is about to eat this casserole So in the play. He uh, eats this casserole and it turns out it's the last casserole her mum ever made before she died a year ago that she's been saving. That's all I can really tell you, because to tell you any more would be spoilers on the play. It deals with couples. It deals with the pressures of being a couple in London and the affordability of that. Uh, it's a problem. It deals with grief. 
It deals with how people can silently conspire not to deal with their problems in, in a, within a couple and take the path of least resistance, which generally is not a good thing to do, I guess, is what we found out. Um, it's very, very, very funny, despite all the premise, and it does obviously get quite serious too. It's a kind of play I'm saying people that think they don't like theatre should come and see this play. It's an hour and a bit, so you're not sitting there for three hours bored. Let's face it, a lot of theatre can be that way. It's real fun, it's really intense, it's really well acted, if I do say so myself. My castmate, Kate Kelly, who's also the co-writer, along with Dominic Morgan and myself, is brilliant. She's an undiscovered gem, so come along and watch it. And how do you find that, being a director, writer, actor, bringing it to a role like that where you're dealing with things like couples and grief, which everyone has gone through, but, you know, there's the directing side that wants to obviously sensationalise it a little bit. There's the writing side that needs to get certain messages across. And then there's the personal side going, well, what did I go through and how comfortable do I feel putting these messages out there without getting traumatised or without thinking, you know, my own journey was my personal journey. That doesn't nece necessarily correlate to everyone's. So when you approach a role like that and you've got those different themes going through, what's your mode of action for that? In general, having an attitude of, I don't know, let's find out. We developed this play in particular through improvisation, which is kind of how I work as a director, get some actors together and we sit in a room, we do some talking, and then we start to work our way how to to improvise around the scenes. And just through that process, you end up, you all share stories, you know, and you all share your experiences. And then you get into the improvisations and things happen where you're like, oh, that's really good. Let's put that in the script. So I guess that divorces any pressure of me as a writer, director, my other co-writers of being like, you know, oh, this is needs to be this way because it's like, this is what it was like for me. It's kind of like that's in the kind of melting pot of the room, you know. My mum did pass away during making the during the writing of this play, right? So my mum died. So it was there were some, and you can't avoid that, I guess, as a as a creative stuff happens in your life, which just will be happening in the scripts. You know, you you have someone pass away, suddenly you've been cast in something where someone passes away for the character. So it's almost impossible not to have moments that are very tough and difficult in the process. If you talk to anyone that makes stuff. We all kind of go, yeah, but we love that. You know, we kind of really want to do that. If it was the day after my mum had died, I wouldn't be in the theatre, you know, I wouldn't be in the rehearsal room. But if it's like six months down the line and I'm kind of in the middle of, of grieving, but it's work, I'm going to kind of bring that in the room. I guess how you deal with that is really humanly, you know, and honestly, and, and be non-toxic about it. You know, you're going to discuss it and talk about it and have cups of teas and not put anyone in a position of doing things they don't want to do and if you find yourself in a position where someone's going look this is just too difficult having the kind of presence to go cool let's find another way and in the finding another way you'll find something usually that's even better bringing this all together your experience as a child actor bringing the experience of going into the theater while bringing your experience of what you're doing right now directing acting writing now you've got your own company, Actors East. How are you looking at that next generation of actors coming through? And what are those, what's that one pearl of wisdom that you want to tell them about the industry they're about to get themselves into? You've got to really love it. Like, and I'm, there's people that have been in this business for a long time who obviously don't love it. <laughs> it's like, you've know got to, you know, you've got to love it. You've got to love the craft. You've got to love the non-glamour of it it's a cold tuesday afternoon and you've just got to get in that rehearsal room or go on to set and you've got to make it work you've just got to love all of that stuff you know so that will save you in the times where the the business the kind of business the showbiz part will come in and try and mess with you or you know and and and, and create problems for you but so if you always just love the acting bit or you just love the making stuff you, you, you're going to be fine in terms of new generations of actors of actors east making this play casserole which you should all come and see March 5th to March 27th at the Arcola Theatre in East London. Come and say hello to me afterwards. Uh, the, the whole point of the place is that it's collaborative, that we get writers and directors and actors in a room as much as possible to make stuff together and just be really kind of playful with that that idea, which is something that in, in the kind of in the industry of making theatre or film is less afforded because there's budgets and there's timelines and there's there's deadlines. Whereas we're creating an actors East environment where anyone can kind of slip in and come into a room and you'll have incredible professional actors that have been working for years alongside, you know, newbies and the same with writers and directors and create this environment of like, we all just love it here and we're going to keep making stuff. That's amazing. Well, my final question ties into that. Obviously, we've lost so many greats over the years. Anisha, Wendy Richards, Barbara Windsor, June Brown, John Barden that you've worked all closely with. 
How mm. do you think they're looking down on you right now and seeing the James that they've nurtured through the generations and what a difference you're now making with those collaborations? Well, I don't believe they're looking down on me. I mean, that's... <laughs> Well, and they're not looking up to me either. I don't, I don't necessarily believe in their afterlife. But if they were, um, I don't know, mate. I think Wendy would be very approving. John Barden would probably kind of grunt at me a little bit. <laughs> June would love it. June Brown was, was, um, you know, for all of her, her kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, camp, I guess, uh, she was a consummate actor. So she she loved acting. She she's someone that always loved it, you know. So I guess they'd be approving, mate. <laughs> oh, mate. Well, I can't thank you enough for talking to me. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate you were letting me delve into the past thirty years of your life. And I'm sorry that there was so much we had to get out there. Oh. But you can go and see James at Castle at the Arcola Theatre in London throughout the month of March 2024. If you love EastEnders, there are interviews on screen with other EastEnders legends, including Neil McDermott who plays Ryan and Sid Owen who plays Ricky. If you enjoyed today's episode of Sir Kinnisky, if you're watching on YouTube, click that subscribe button, click that bell, give a thumbs up, and leave a nice little comment. And whether you're wherever you're listening, leave a five star rating and review, and click that subscribe button. Let's keep spreading the word. It's okay to not be okay on TikTok at Johnny Seafoot 92 on Instagram at Johnny Seafoot at Skin Insco Podcast James where can people find you? at James Alexandria on Instagram and X or whatever it is and yeah you can tell yeah. that he's been brought up in the industry pre-social media my thanks <laughs> to James and I'll speak to you very soon take care bye